officially convene the Rotary Club of Salem and this our 100th year. My name is Tammy Denny and it is my honor and privilege to serve as your president coming to the end of my term. So now if you will please join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. Renee, would you please uh, fly the flag? On three, one, two, three, I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States, States of, America, of America and to the Republic for which it stands, stands one nation, nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's see here. I make sure everyone's still muted. And now moving along with our program, um, we want to be sure and welcome all of our guests. Um, Mary Louise, are you the guest of Claudia's? So if so, let me just find Claudia here and I'll unmute you. Claudia. I'm always happy to have Mary Louise as my guest, but she's also a member of South Salem and gets to come to any meeting she would like. Okay, well, welcome Mary Louise Van Atta. We're glad you're here. Thank Thanks you for joining much. us today. Thank you. Yay. Nice to you. Okay, and did I hear somebody else's voice? Okay. Um, all right, so welcome guest, and also Laura Foley is a guest today, technically, until we uh, induct her, so welcome, Laura. And now for our invocation and inspirational words, um, Patricia Bowman, I believe you can take yourself off mute and give us our invocation, words of inspiration, please. Maybe can you hear me? Maybe fine. Oh, there you go. Now I see you. Now I hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Well, in, in President Tammy and fellow Rotarians, I feel like in light of everything that's going on around us, that today might be a good time for us to reflect for this part of the meeting on our Rotary uh, four-way test, because it's certainly been on my mind. You know, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Let's use this as a guide this week as we move through all the, the uproar and the confusion that we're in. Thank you, Patricia. I appreciate that. And we appreciate you greatly. Thank you so much. Uh, Bell Thank Rears, you. Allison Kelly, I believe you can unmute yourself. Is that true? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, all right. So um, so for everybody, I only received one bell ringer by email and I will do my best to check our comments. Um, so I'm gonna read that one. I also will admit that we've been having some email issues. Um, so if you sent one to me, we'll go hopefully have enough time to just listen, make sure that we get them all. I added three so that we could keep our numbers up. So I'll start um, with one from John McCulley. And um, I just gotta say, I just love John and Julie. I mean, I'm just gonna say, I've known them for like 35 years and they're pretty amazing. So there you go. Um, John McCulley tells us, this is a $120 bell ringer to honor and thank members of the Salem Rotary Foundation Board for all their work during the year. The generous support of club members was overseen by the steady stewardship of board members whose able guidance provided $45,000 worth of commitments as the foundation fulfilled its mission as the charitable heart of the Rotary Club of Salem. Please ring the bell six times to recognize Jane Downing, Barry Nelson, Tim Nissen, Doug Parham, John Shirley, and Linda Wooters. President Tammy, please ring the bell. All right, thank you. All right, and um, so not seeing any others, I will start with my three, and then President Tammy, you can cue me if there are others that come through. So um, the first one, I would like to ring the bell for all hospital workers, including my husband, Rick, who are on the front lines seeing patients with COVID-19 almost every day. May they all continue to be safe and protected and free from illness, and may they know of our respect and support. President Tammy, please ring the bell. 
And um, I would like to, the next one is I'd like to ring the bell in honor of all persons of color who may be suffering from racism and the emotional impact of such blatantly violent acts of racism as we've seen recently. As Rotarians, may we be committed to justice, kindness, peacemaking, and equity, celebrating all of the beautiful diversity of our global family. President Tammy, please ring the bell. And the last one from me is I would like to ring the bell for all fathers in honor of the upcoming Father's Day holiday on Sunday. My own father played an enormously positive role in my life and provided an outstanding example of ethics, compassion, and service. My husband of 38 years, Rick, has done a fantastic job of being an amazing father to our children, and I honor him for all of his many sacrifices over the years. Happy Father's Day, all of you Rotary Fathers. President Tammy, please ring the bell. Okay. okay, thank you, Allison. Are there any other uh, virtual hands that are going to go up in the participants box? Anybody raising their hand or anyone you, want to unmute? You can't, see, you can't see my hand, but I... Okay, oh. I see, I hear your voice, Ozzy. You have the floor, sir. I'm ringing the bell twice for each of my two broken arms. <laughs> what? For real? For real. Yeah. Oh, Ozzy, you just got well from broken arms. I know, but I did it again. This time I got both of them. I'm sorry. Okay, so ringing the bell twice? Yes. Okay, love you, mostly my friend. That, mostly that was a whine, okay? Yeah, I, I hear that in your voice. I'm sorry. So here's a bell ringer for you. All right, and Nether, did I see anyone else's hand go up virtually or uh, in real? Yes. Okay, Ron Rebell, I see your hand. Go ahead, sir. Okay, uh, I'd like to ring the bell for Larry Koenig and Steve Martin uh, as uh, members of the History Committee and all they've done to help make the display at uh, Mission Mill Building for Willamette Heritage Center. The display came down uh, after an ex extended period of time, came down this Monday. So <laughs> thanks to uh, to Steve and to Larry for everything they did to contribute to the club's 100th anniversary display. Thank you, Ron. Okay, Is there any, are there any other bell ringers? Okay, moving along then. Thank you. Thank you to all the bell ringers. And now on to Laura Foley. It's my pleasure to introduce to you club members, Laura Foley, who is very excited about joining our club. Laura is a second generation Rotarian, the daughter of a Paul Harris fellow. 30 years old, she is originally from the beautiful island of Maui, but has also lived in Arizona, California, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and now plans to build her roots in the great state of Oregon. She received a Bachelor's of Art degree in English education from Cal Poly Pomona in 2012, and since then has worked for the Salvation Army all over the nation in both administrative and directive positions. She has been an officer in the Salvation Army for three years with the current rank of Lieutenant. Before moving to Salem, Laura oversaw the work of the Salvation Army in Northeast Portland and was affiliated with the Downtown Portland Rotary Club through her ex-husband, Last summer, Laura moved into a new position and now works with two other officers to oversee the work of the Salvation Army in Marion and Polk counties, which includes the Croc Center, Lighthouse Transitional Shelter, and Social Service campuses. Laura is passionate about serving those in need and as a, pa as a passion project is currently working to create a performing arts program at the Croc Center that will specialize in theater arts. When she's not busy in the nonprofit world, Laura is a full-time single parent who loves spending quality time with her adorable three-year-old son, Callum, and a vivacious Australian cattle dog named Sydney. Laura is an accomplished musician who plays piano, brass instruments, vocal arts, and musical theater. By becoming a Rotarian, Laura hopes to make lasting connections and friendships with fellow bridge builders seeking to serve and love the world around us through acts of service in our communities. And now, as your president, it's my honor to 
read to you the induction. So Laura, through your membership in Rotary, you can build lifelong friendships and join forces with like-minded people around the world who desire to make a difference in their communities. Our club is comprised of leaders who embrace our motto, service above self. As Rotarians, we have pledged to uphold the highest ethical standards, subscribe to the object of Rotary, and live by the four-way test. Regular attendance at our weekly meetings is an important part of your membership, but Rotary is much more than a club. As you become more involved, you'll begin to understand the power of Rotary through expanded friendships and involvement in your choice of many committees and fellowship activities we offer. As you build friendships and contribute to our, our impact here and around the world, you will truly understand what it means to be a member of this club and the 1.2 million Rotarians worldwide. We are a vibrant, action-oriented club, and as such, we know you will roll up your sleeves and get involved. Therefore, Laura, as the newest member of our club, do you pledge to uphold the four-way test, to serve on at least two committees, and to contribute to our club in every way that you can? I do. That's a good answer. <laughs> and fellow Rotarians, do you pledge to warmly welcome Laura into our club and to offer her your full support in all that we do? We do. Excellent. Please welcome Laura as our newest member of the Rotary Club of Salem. Yay! Yay! Yay welcome! Yay. welcome. Yay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so Laura, thank you so, for joining our club. We look forward to getting to know you better in the weeks and months to come. So welcome to our club. <clears throat> thank you. Oh, thank you. So moving along now, uh, club announcements. Uh, Chuck Swank has asked me to offer one announcement. Uh, in yesterday's e-blast, it was made clear that we are uh, in need of finalizing our membership roster. So we need to know uh, from every single member whether or not you intend to renew. So if you do not intend to renew, please let us know that. If you do plan to renew, but you haven't communicated, we absolutely need to have that answer uh, right away so that we can have our full roster complete uh, and ready for our dues going to Rotary International and District by July 1st. So we have to know your answer. We don't necessarily have to have your money um, right now, but we do need to know your answer. Otherwise, we'll be forced to uh, skinny up our list and not forward dollars for members who have not committed to renew. Okay, so are there any other announcements at this moment in time? All right, hearing none. Um, Lauren, you have red badgers. You have to take yourself off mute. I did, but then I actually hit something else. I'm really okay. good at technology. Go. Now I see you. Okay, <laughs> so go for it, Lauren. Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Gutierrez with Salem Health Hospitals and Clinics. I'm here today as your blue badge um, committee chair person-ish. Um, I've got three people today who are on our red badge list working towards our blue badge who are um, completing their greeting tasks. So usually greeting is sitting or standing at the door when people come in. Um, but we're having to punt a little bit in this wonderful COVID time. So we've devised a few questions. And um, today, Cameron, Selma, and Trisha are going to answer the questions. They're going to give you their name, their professional title and organization. And they're going to tell you about their favorite place to travel, the name and location of their high school, and one fact that people may not know about them. And they can give you lots of explanation or no explanation. And we just get to live with it. So Cameron, take it away. All right. Uh, hey, everybody. So I'm Cameron Hunt. I'm a financial advisor with Edward Jones Investments. My office is uh, downtown in the Equitable Center building. Uh, my favorite place to travel for right now is, uh, I'd say, Japan. Uh, I'm paying tribute with my wallpaper here. Um, my high school was Oregon Episcopal School, which is up in the Portland area. And the one fact people mostly don't know is, I think it was 2004, the summer of 2004, my old band opened the beer garden stage for the REO Speedwagon Journey and Sticks Tour up at the Gorge. And that's it. I think I'm supposed to pass it to the next person, is that right? Yeah, Selma, let's pass it off to Selma, go ahead. Okay, um, I'm Selma Pierce. 
and I'm a dentist, a community volunteer, and I'm also running for office for State Rep House District 20. I went to high school in San Francisco at Washington. It was pretty close to the beach. You had to watch out for the seagulls that stole your lunch at, uh, or bombed you on your head. Um, I like to travel anywhere where there's good food. And um, I think the food is a window into uh, these cultures that we visit. And yeah, I have to say, people don't know that I have eaten a quay or guinea pig in Ecuador. And it does kind of taste like chicken. <laughs> awesome, thanks, Selma. Trisha, you're up. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Am I good? All right, my name is Trisha Frizzell, formerly Trisha Ratliff. I'm with Mid Willamette Valley Community Action Agency, and I'm the program director for Homey Services. We serve homeless and at-risk youth ages 11 to 18. My favorite place to travel is the Oregon coast. Out of all the places I've been, um, I'm a true coastie at heart, and I love the beauty of our, of our cold Oregon coast. Uh, my high school is McNary High School in Kaiser. Go Celts. Um, and some fun facts about me is I'm an avid country music lover. George Strait is the best. Um, none of the new country stuff, all the traditional and older. And I also am obsessed with wiener dogs. I have two of them, and they are most definitely my little fur babies. Awesome. Thanks, Trisha. Thanks, everybody, for introducing yourselves today. Um, and for all the rest of you Red Badgers out there, just one more little push if you need to greet. Um, give, give me a shout and we'll get you up here. And if you have other things to do for your Red Badge, I'm also happy to help out. Thank you for that, Lauren. And let's make all of our Red Badgers feel welcome and appreciated for sharing. Thank you so much. Okay, and now to our district governor, Diane Noriega. Uh, she has a special award. So. Please, um, District Governor Noriega, you have the floor. Thanks, Tammy. Well, it's just a, it's such a pleasure to be here and I'm looking down and I'm seeing 85 participants in the room, which is just amazing. Now, as you know, I was there for your 100th anniversary birthday party as well as for your fundraiser. iPad 72 is a, uh, causing some interference. Anyway, I was there for your celebrations. And so I didn't do my, um, my usual um, official visit presentation. And so I, I was so pleased that Tammy invited me back to uh, visit with you once again and to do this presentation today. So I usually, in, in my typical visit, I, I introduce this topic by telling the story of how I met Rotary. I met Rotary long ago and far away when I was working at California State University and I was in one of my first uh, mid-level administrative positions and I was tasked with putting together a collaborative, a collaborative that was composed of higher education, four-year institutions, community colleges, and K-12 and business. Well, I'm an educator, that's my career path. So I had no trouble at all with the education part, but I really didn't know how to connect with business. So I went back to the president and I said, how should I do this? Should I go to the Chamber of Commerce? What do you suggest? And he said, oh no, go to the downtown Rotary Club, they'll help you. So I called up the president of the club and I said, hi, I'm, I'm Diane Noriega. I'm with Cal State Sacramento, and we're putting together a collaborative, blah, blah, blah. And the focus is working with at-risk youth to try to keep them from dropping out of high school. And we want to figure out ways to support them to stay in high school and go on to get additional training in college. And so he said, you know, that's a great idea. Tell you what why don't you be our speaker next week? So I showed up at the downtown Rotary Club. Now remember, this was the mid to late 80s. 
So I walk in, there's like 300 men in the room. I couldn't see any other women except for the little old lady in the back who was playing the piano while they sang patriotic songs. So I thought, okay. But then they started doing happy dollars and sad dollars and brags. And I, I really didn't get it. I couldn't figure out what this club was about and I couldn't figure out why I was there. But it was my turn to speak. So I got up and I made my pitch about this collaboration and how important it was for, you know, students who have potential, but also potential of dropping out, that we help them and support them and motivate them to stay in school so that they graduate and go on and get additional training and skill development so that they can work for people like you so that they can work in your businesses when they when when they're prepared so that they can learn what it means to be an insurance broker so that they can learn what it means to be a travel agent so that they need know what it is to work in healthcare, whatever it is so everybody applauded politely and i went back to my office one week later i got a phone call from the same president of the club and he said okay diane we're in and I said, okay, okay, what does that mean? And he said, I've got a hundred men in the club that are willing to be mentors to high school students who have potential but are at risk of dropping out. But he says, we like the potential part. Can you help us with that? I said, of course I can, because I'm working with the school counselors. They know who these kids are. Great. So he said, and not only that, but these gentlemen also want to hire these at-risk youth who have potential as paid interns in their offices, not doing copies and coffee, but really learning what the business is about. And I, I was just stunned. I thought that was incredible. What, what an opportunity. But wait, there's more. They said we'd also like to match whatever those students earn as paid interns. We're gonna match it and put it in an account for them. If they stay in high school, graduate from high school, get accepted into college, whether it's two year or four year, they will have that scholarship to help them get started in college. I was stunned silent. I didn't know what to say. In my mind, I'm thinking, these are the same guys that are singing the patriotic songs and doing happy dollars and sad dollars. I don't care. These are people of action. They stepped in. They put together this program with, in collaboration with the institutions, kicked it off. One year later, those kids were getting scholarships. Those kids had skills. Those kids were moving on. And the best part of it is, about 20 years later, when I'm now in Rotary and in an international convention, I meet a gentleman from Sacramento. And he said, you know, where are you from? And I said, oh, Sacramento. I said, you know, I worked in Sacramento at, the, um, at Sac State. And I said, do you have any recollection of the jobs and college program that we put together? And he smiled at me and he said, it's still going, Diane it's still going. That's what I learned. That's what Rotary is about. We're people of action. And that's what I want to do today is to recognize someone in your club who represents, you know, from top to bottom, that value and that energy. And so it's my pleasure to recognize this individual from your Rotary Club of Salem, who will be the ninth 2019 2020 person of action is your as i'm aware and you're aware to this is a big year for you celebrating your 100th birthday and your 100th anniversary this person is the one who took the leap of faith to launch a fundraising campaign to bring life to the centennial project now known as the rotary club of salem jerry frank amphitheater and I had the pleasure of meeting Jerry at your fundraiser um, last January. This person hasn't wavered in the commitment to see this fundraising effort to its culmination. 
and has spent countless hours on the phone and away from business and family to see it complete. Every Rotary Club of Salem member knows who we're talking about, so I won't try to keep it a secret any longer. Barry Nelson, it is my honor to recognize you as a person of action. You've been a past president of the club. In your free time, you serve as a baseball umpire official. But thank you, Barry, for your vision and your unwavering commitment to raise the money necessary to the, see the Centennial Project to its construction. The fundraising effort has exceeded $3 million. I think it's even more than that at this to date. And our fingers are crossed that the outstanding grant applications will get this project across the finish line. So please unmute us and let us all give Jerry a huge round of applause. And Barry. Good job, Barry. Good job, Barry. Good job, Barry. Good job, Barry. <laughs> and Barry Nelson, would you hey, like Barry. to say a few words? Do you, do you want oh, to goodness. Speak? Is there a speech involved? That, that's, uh, <laughs> well, thank you very much, Diane. And every... I'm, there we go. I think I'm unmuted again. <laughs> Um, thank you. It's, it's been a long five years and we didn't know what we were getting into when we took this leap of faith, but uh, certainly um, it, it, it couldn't be done without Rotary. And we've said many times in our club that uh, um, we, we can do together what, what we can't do alone. Mm -hmm. And so all of y'all uh, chipping in and, and doing what you've done in order to advance this project. And uh, this really should be a, a joint award because I definitely couldn't do it without Ken Van Osdall and, and his uh, co-chairmanship of the, the project and the task force and the, the boards that have supported this uh, over the last five years. Uh, it's gonna be an exciting year to come um, as uh, less than a month from now, you're gonna see dirt turning on the site. And a year from now, you're going to see the Jerry Frank Salem Rotary Amphitheater out there. Um, so it's it's an exciting time. And thank all of you for, for your support and uh, belief along the way. Uh, initially, I know it was a little uh, hard to believe and, and we had some doubts, but uh, by golly, we're here and, and we're doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. On behalf of the club, um, our sincere thanks for your, you and Ken and your unwavering dedication and leadership in uh, bringing this project to fruition. So we're excited to see that first shovel go on the ground. We'll be even more excited to host an event there and celebrate uh, the finality of the project. Uh, but this has uh, certainly been a fabulous centennial project and effort on your part. So thank you, Barry, with deep sincerity. So thank you so much to you and Ken. Thank okay, you. Barry, this is, this is the actual award, which uh, will be in the mail to you. And it looks like a big bottle cap, but it's actually, you know, people have actually need something, you know, a little more useful than a pin. And so it, it's actually a refrigerator magnet and a bottle opener. So I want you to put this on your refrigerator and every time you go to get yourself a cold one, you'll be reminded that you're a person of action. Excellent. Thank you, District Governor Noriega. We really appreciate you being with us today and thank you for presenting you. that award. Thank you. Okay, so now uh, Sue Bloom is our program chair today. Sue, you have the floor. President Timmy. Um, First off, I'd like, before I uh, introduce you to Bryce Peterson, our speaker today, I wanted to introduce you to one of our, um, one of our Red Badgers, Stephen Goto, who's on the call here today. Stephen is a financial advisor with Waddell and Reed in Albany. He's been an, an advisor with them since 2009. He has a 20 month old daughter and another one due in October. He and his wife delivered Phoenix, their firstborn, in Building D at Salem Hospital and are getting ready to deliver their second one there as well. 
And Stephen's looking forward to hearing about what policies and procedures are in place at the hospital um, to keep it safe moving forward for folks um, who participate in hospital things. So welcome, Stephen. And then on to our presenter, uh, Bryce Peterson, Director of Community Outreach at Salem Hospital. Um, Bryce will provide an overview of what has taken place at the hospital for the past 45 days and how it's prepping moving forward. And then um, Bryce will also highlight several of the hospital's community outreach activities. And just on a quick personal note, um, Bryce and his team um, are always so incredibly helpful um, to me and my, my folks here at the club when we have questions or we need um, advice on how we might best support our families that, and kids that we serve. Um, he's just a very proactive, um, kind, helpful person. And um, the club and many other of our nonprofit partners on the call here today um, had the opportunity to, to shine a light on all the great work of Salem Health um, in a recent magnet accreditation process that they have that they put forward. So um, with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Bryce um, to talk about Salem Health. Thank you, Sue, and thank you all for the opportunity to get to share. Um, I'm gonna uh, pull up the PowerPoint here. Let's make sure we're all seeing that. Just a quick thumbs up from people if we can all see, see what's on the screen. Okay, great. Never want, never want to assume these days with all of our Zoom calls. Um, so today I'm gonna do a, do a few things. So my, my intention is to give you a quick overview here. We're gonna talk uh, briefly about sort of the timeline of events that have happened around COVID. Um, you know, when things really started in our community, some of the responses um, and, and kind of work our way all the way up um, to how the community has come alongside the hospitals. We've walked through a series of challenges and then really where we're, where we're sitting at today, especially in light of um, you know, some of the recent headlines we've been getting around this second wave. Um, so I'll do my best to give you guys kind of a broad overview and then we'll open up for some questions um, towards the end. So to kind of reground us really quick, um, zooming all the way back to January, which as I was putting together this presentation, I, I was, I, I couldn't even get my head around that this was really six months ago. Um, if so it was early January, China had reported their first death, right? And so it was around January 30th that the World Health Organization first declared this um, state of emergency, which, uh, or global health emergency. And, and at that point, that's when the United States actually did their first um, travel ban to China. So that, that was all the way back in January when we were first starting to hear about this. So sort of simultaneously, right, that large cruise ship in China detained several thousand people, started to see cases in Europe, and this is all now early parts of February. And at the hospital, we started forming a, a, a group amongst our providers to get together and start putting together some basic protocols and, and get those in place. Um, referencing back to things we've done in the past around measles, Ebola, Zika, um, sort of just putting together a framework for, we don't really know what this is gonna look like, but we know it's coming. So let's have some, some thoughts in place. The other big part um, that we were looking at back in February was around, was around PPE. And um, certainly that became the headline for um, most of the United States was around this equipment. Um, but even as early as February, we had been given fairly good indication that there was gonna be some supply chain issues here. Um, so, so we didn't move to um, any type of reduced PPE usage yet in February, but this is when we started putting everything visible in our organization using all our lean management tools we had trackers which would daily give us red or green outcomes on how we were doing on our inventory levels. And we were constantly working with our suppliers to try and get as much on hand as we could. Um, so then, then comes March. So through the month of February, we'd set up a series of triggers. So if we had a confirmed case at the hospital, then these things would happen. So as it would turn out, March 11th, we had our first confirmed case um, at Salem Health. Um, and as a result of that, over the next two days, um, we launched and put in place a respiratory clinic. Um, and we, we put, uh, we prohibited all visitors from coming on campus um, with very little exception. Um, we canceled our employee shuttle. Uh, you uh, may have been aware of this, but with the new patient tower we're, we're currently building, um, over a thousand of our employees were getting to campus every day via a shuttle. And because there was no way to socially distance on the shelves, we had to shut that down and start stacking parking around our campus. 
Um, we, we closed down all non-urgent visits and moved everyone to virtual care over a two-day period. Um, we moved all of our staff remote who could be put remote. And then we put in place screening at all entries, and then we canceled all non-urgent or elective procedures. So uh, to say it was maybe the, the longest two days of uh, our lives would, would maybe be an understatement, but we knew, hey, this is in our community. We've got we've to gotta lock down um, the healthcare facility and preserve our capacity for if we saw this um, inevitable surge. Um, so just to kind of uh, take us in here where we're at. So, so we roll into April and April um, is actually where we hit our peak. And, and while this might be a little bit hard to see, April 6th, the max amount of patients we had in our hospital was 31. And that was on April 6th. And so this, this blue line, which we'll come back to a little bit later, is COVID positive cases. This rather fluctuating orange one is people who are in-house and are pending results, right? So they're not necessarily positive, but they're, they may sort of symptom or, or believe to have it, and they're waiting for test results to come in. Um, so the, the, the narrative around April um, really was, we were prepped and ready to, to surge up to 644 beds on our campus. And just to give you perspective, Salem Health is a 454 bed hospital. Um, so we effectively added 190 beds um, that we could flex into as we needed. Um, we didn't see the surge that we thought we were gonna see, um, thankfully. Oregon, Oregon was fairly favorable early out. Um, but what was really neat during this time was how big our community came alongside and stepped up to help and support the hospital. So we'll kind of step away from some of the clinical facts for a minute, and I want to share some of these positive stories with you, and then we'll come back to um, jumping back into some of this data. Uh, again, many of you many of you saw this, but um, about mid-April, we put up an ask to the community. We need about 10,000 masks to get us through um, uh, this next 30-day window. So we put together these sewing kits and, and we, we own a building called Kmart, uh, or the old Kmart on Mission Street. And so we said, okay, you can come pick them up on these three days. We sent out some presents. You know that. What's that? Okay. Well, we, anyway, so we put out these press releases and um, I'm walking out of my office, which is located over by Willamette University. And it's about a half an hour before we're supposed to be doing these mass pickups and traffic is stopped at Willamette University. And sort of simultaneously, I get a call from my friend uh, who's sitting on I-5 um, up by Mission Street, um, all the way down by the, uh, by kind of that Lancaster exit down over there by uh, Sports Authority. And he goes, Bryce, traffic is stopped on uh, Highway 22 all the way back here, and we're backed up on I-5. And um, there was about a seven mile backup uh, from both directions of people coming to help support the local hospital and pick up mask making kits. Um, and I mean, it, it almost gives me chills to think about just the, the outpour that came from our community. It was one of the most beautiful examples I've ever seen of our community coming together. And, and uh, so anyways, I run down there. I, I literally ran down Mission Street because they needed people to help do traffic. So I'm running down Mission Street. I'm fielding phone calls. And uh, I get down there and, and there's news reporters there and they, they all say to me, well, don't you think everyone's here just to take masks home because there's such a personal shortage of masks and, and you'll never see these again. And um, maybe naively, I, I said to him, I don't even, we haven't even gone down that scenario. We don't think people are gonna respond that way. And we gave out 10,000 masks and we actually received 10,000 masks back. Um, some of them didn't meet some of the quality standards. The sewing wasn't done in a certain way, but we received every single mask back that we sent out. Not a single person used it for their own good. Um, and so for those of you who were stuck in traffic, uh, we're sorry, but uh, our nursing staff was literally in tears um, after they saw this showing of support. So uh, pretty, pretty special to be a part of this kind of a community. Uh, also wanna give a quick nod to some businesses. In total, we had 73 businesses who literally just showed up at our door and donated PPE from their, their system. Places like Salem Kaiser School District, the science teachers from um, Sprague went around and did collections, all sorts of businesses. Garmin actually shut down one of their manufacturing plants and started producing PPE for the hospital. Um, again, just, it's, it, it was one of the more humbling things I've, I've really been a part of. 
Um, we started receiving mass donations from uh, groups we never even met. The Oregon Chinese Coalition showed up with 6,000 in 95 masks that they had ordered from China. Uh, and then they brought in 3,000 duck bills a couple weeks later. Again, it got us through a critical shortage we had at this point. And then this statistic really blows my mind. And, and you've probably heard a little bit about this from Cindy uh, Lanazar, but um, since March 24th until about two weeks ago, we were feeding about 800 people every day from donated community meals. Um, just, just amazing, the, the outpouring. And, and one of my favorites, you know, many of us know the Kay family, Josh Kay, Lillian Kay, um, and the Vindy's family, Conrad is pictured here, um, and the Kay Spear family, they all pooled funds together and they um, brought in a meal for our environmental services team, the people who are cleaning, cleaning the rooms, right? And um, that was feeding about 800 people at a time where their morale was, was maybe at an all-time low. And then some of my other favorites, Wallery's Pizza, they became a tremendous partner of ours, giving pizza to, to family members who were receiving FaceTime visits from nurses and some of the extra care um, all throughout that month. And then my last sort of nod to the community before we jump back in is, is Memoji. Um, they pledged um, during the middle of March that they would provide a meal a day um, for a unit at our hospital and they have done so faithfully um, up until even today. Um, so big kudos to Memoji and their family. Thank you for, for all you guys have done. All right, so that's kind of the fun stuff. Um, we'll, we'll segue back into May. Um, so May is actually when we start seeing um, a real drop and, and uh, right here we hit bottom in May. And at one point um, in May, we were down um, under eight patients who were positive in the hospital. And so at that point, you know, Marin County's um, just entering phase one. Um, Sue mentioned this, we did a redesignation of a really important accreditation for our hospital around Magnet. Um, our numbers continued to decline and we were actually able to get back open um, our non-urgent and elective procedures. Um, again, this is all sort of in a cadence that um, is brought down from the Oregon Health Authority. Um, visitor restrictions are still in place, but things are, things are going fairly good into May. Um, and in middle of May, we, we get a surprise from the local business community. And the Salem Chamber put out these wonderful signs that said, heroes work here, right in the middle of our campus. Um, and, and what I thought was neat about this is this initiative was funded all by businesses who weren't providing their service. Uh, these were businesses who were, were literally not working. And out of their own pocket, they came in, they, they blessed the hospital. Sort of simultaneously, Enlightened Theatrics showed up one night um, and plugged in a sound system and um, sang several songs of hope as staff were coming in to the parking garage to get into the evening shift. And, and, I, and I showed up for this one, um, I'd heard they were coming and the whole parking garage was, uh, was literally just filled with this echoing sort of reverb of enlightened theatrics. And they were, they were dancing in, the, in the, um, the entryway and they were high-fiving staff, like air high-fives as they were coming into the parking garage. And again, What's hard to describe in this PowerPoint is, well, we only had, let's say 30 patients at our peak, the, the fear and the stress that was associated with, um, that, or that is associated with COVID is really unmatched to anything we've seen in the hospital before. And so for staff, um, this was a huge morale booster. And again, just another way our community stepped up, stepped up for the hospital. Um, again, this, this is a photo of uh, our community health education center, which ended up being converted to the community care store as Costco showed up with a semi truck full of non perishable food. C's candy showed up and they dropped off 5,000 chocolate bars. Um, they, they said, well, we didn't get Easter this year. Uh, we didn't get our Easter business this year. So you might as well give it to your staff. And so we were able to give every staff member as they walked in, the Portland Press, which is a new business that's just opened up um, downtown, they couldn't open on their expectant date, so they donated all their coffee and their pastries that they had made for their opening to us. Liberty Christian Church came and donated, World's Finest Chocolate donated, Dutch Bros Coffee brought in flats of coffee, which um, all the nursing staff says was, was maybe one of their favorite gifts, uh, as you can imagine. So then we kind of move into to June, where we're sitting at right now. Um, we are seeing an uptick in the number of confirmed cases over the last seven days. Um, these are just the numbers. I, I put them up here to give you sort of a, 
reference, these numbers are available on salemhealth.org forward slash COVID-19. Um, that's a great way to stay in the loop of what's going on at your local hospital. Um, sometimes it can feel difficult to know, but these numbers are really the guiding light um, when you're trying to get a pulse on what's going on um, at my hospital. So just to kind of kind of look at this chart again, um, so you can see what I'm talking about with this this uptick we're seeing. Um, this was the this was the bottom we had previously had, and this was the previous peak. And as we're working our way back up, we're we're sitting right here right now. So we are seeing um, if you threw a trend line on this, we are trending upward in our community, um, but we we do have a much lower number of pending in in the hospital. So this data can be a little bit hard to discern. Um, I will say the hospital has continued to support the county in their efforts um, to reopen um, and to get to phase two and phase one. Um, today, the Oregon Health Authority did come out with a statement and, and I thought I would just read it. I think it is sort of a nice synopsis of, of um, where they're sort of at in their compilation of this data. Um, they said, reopening Oregon will continue to require us to be cautious we can slow the spread of COVID-19 and perfect our loved ones, but we all need to do a part and make this happen. This means Oregonians will need to continue to consider the risks when they venture outside their homes or interact with people outside their close circles of contact. Practicing physical distancing, wearing face coverings when physical distancing isn't possible, staying home when sick, limiting unnecessary travel, and practicing good hand hygiene remains a critical strategy as we help slow the spread. And right now, I think that's about as much as um, anyone can really say on what we're seeing. Um, there's certainly a variety of speculations as to why we're seeing this again. But as our CEO has put it fairly eloquently is we're now in this phase where we're, where we're having to live with COVID. So we're kind of moving from, from you know, uh, is it going to be around? Is it going to go away to this is becoming a reality for us. And so how do we now get into a place where we're where we're practicing some of these important practices, but also living with, with what is now our new reality and here to stay for, um, for the foreseeable uh, future. Um, financially, as you can imagine, this has been a, been a big hit on the hospital, um, largely because um, we canceled a lot of our money-making operations, those procedures I referenced, and um, you know, the hospital's typically about 84% uh, full during this time of year. We've been closer to 50% for the last few months. We're back up in the 60% now. Um, it, we're projecting a $52 million loss through the end of this month um, off of what we were budgeted. Um, you know, again, hospitals statewide are projecting about a $60 million loss. Um, rural hospitals are some of the hardest hit. Um, and um, there is some um, federal money that has come in. Um, but currently we're projecting that it, it covers about a month's worth of financial losses. So, um, you know, the economics of it are certainly difficult, but looking forward, um, safety continues to be our highest priority. If you come to the hospital campus, you will be screened. Your temperature is going to be taken. Um, visitor restrictions are still in place. There are exceptions um, and the hospitals uh, open to managing those conversations on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You can go online, again, that salemhealth.org forward slash COVID and read the, read the exceptions that are in place. Um, there, there's a few itemized there. Um, and bottom line is we're here to stay, we're prepared. Um, currently we have plenty of capacity to help with our need. And uh, at that point, um, I just wanna say, uh, we couldn't be more grateful for the support that we have received from our community. Um, truly amazing. Um, and, and that story about the face mask with the seven mile backup, um, I think this gives you insight to how incredible it was. It had made it onto three world newses um, as one of their highlight stories. Um, and if you look really closely in the background, you will see me running down Mission Street in a green jacket um, covered in sweat as I'm trying to tell people to turn away because there's no more masks. So uh, with that, I will happily open up the floor to questions and answer what I can. Okay, I, I'm waiting to see if we have any hands going up in the participant. Okay, John McCauley, I see that your hand is up. John McCauley, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. And Bryce, you Okay, just one moment, John. Sorry, Bryce, you can go ahead and, and click away from sharing your screen, sir. Okay, let me, uh, I know what I'm doing. 
promise. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Okay, John, go ahead and answer your ask your question, please. Oh, uh, thank you, Bryce. That was very interesting. My question is: the data you presented is that just the Salem campus, or does it include your other campuses uh, in the valley? Um, that is uh, that is Salem Health, um, our main campus in Salem, Oregon. Yeah, that doesn't include our primary care or our West Valley Hospital. Are there other, oh, okay, I have more people that have raised their hand. Excellent, Rick Galpo, your turn, sir. Uh, Bryce, when, when all this started, the, the initial um, kind of cry was to flatten the curve and flatten the curve was kind of the rationale for all the, um, um, all the restrictions we put into place. Um, and that, that whole cry was to kind of make sure that the hospitals were able to handle the load. Um, yeah. Can you tell me, it, it seems like the, um, it seems like that issue, first of all, uh, uh, maybe because of all the things we did, but it never arose. But is there any concern now these days about the hospitals being overwhelmed even, so even with that small, that growth coming up, is there any concerns about overwhelming now or is it, is it a different issue? Yeah, at this point, the hospital feels very comfortable with the capacity we have, um, you know, as we go over these coming weeks, I think the data will continue to reveal itself if, if that problem may arise again. Um, but as we're currently sitting, no, that's, that's not the conversation we're having. I think um, a lot of people are really just struggling with understanding um, all that's contributing to uh, the variances we're seeing, right? There's a lot of speculation as to what it is. Um, but uh, again, it's, um, it's sort of been a sit back and wait for a little bit of that. But good question. Okay, thank you for that question. Uh, Nick Williams, you're next. Hey Bryce. Hey Nick. I just wanted to say that first and foremost, but um, <laughs> excellent presentation. And uh, is Salem Health keeping any kind of score in terms of those that are testing positive and that may be asymptomatic? Because that's been one of the challenges and I'm kind of curious locally how many people are getting it and don't even know they have it. Yeah, well, Salem Health just finished testing all of our staff um, for the antibody testing. And um, of course, it was a voluntary process for our staff, but many <laughs> did to do so. And we're getting that data back now um, and, and should have a little bit more to share. We're, we're kind of putting it into a larger pot of data with the county. But yeah, certainly the asymptomatic bit of it is, um, it can be a bit worrisome, yeah. Good question. Thank you, Nick, for that question. And Sue Bloom, you have the next question. Thank you. Um, thank you, Bryce. That was re very, very informative and um, um, appreciate all, everyone's leadership at the hospital. I was curious about um, the Health Education Center and if there'll be any kind of shift or addition, I don't know what the right words are, yeah. um, moving forward post-COVID. Uh, do you mean like how well, we're doing our business or specific to like curriculum we may be teaching? Yeah, curriculum or what your outreach could change or things that you're adding to your ongoing programs there? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, we've got a slew of hygiene uh, programs <laughs> ready to go. Uh, but, the, but the other one that's, that's been interesting is, um, you know, uh, mental health, behavioral health um, coming out of this time is um, certainly rising to the, to the top. We're actually putting in place, um, maybe some of you are familiar with it, it's called Headspace. Um, it's an application that kind of helps do some resiliency work. Um, it's a program that we've seen a lot of success with, um, help provide that tool to a lot of our community partners and do some training around it. Um, it's been a big boon for our staff during this time. So um, yeah, I think I would say that, and then we're also um, uh, leveraging technology for a lot of our classes in education now. Um, a, a, another big one coming out of this is actually diabetes. Um, people have been home, people have been stress eating, um, limited amounts of exercise for some. Um, and so that's certainly rising to the top as well. And so we're doing some larger diabetic classes now, uh, or pre-diabetes programming um, out of the Community Health Education Center. Thank you. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, Selma Pierce, do you have the next question? Um, so in the beginning, there was a a lot of difficulty with accessing PPEs. Um, how is that now? Because I know some of the dentists are having some difficulty accessing that for their daily work right now. 
Um, I would, I would have to maybe get you a more technical answer from our supply chain. The only thing I guess I can comment on it that I'm actively aware of is we're, we're no longer um, rationing our PPE and the way that we were early on. And we're, we're not having any trouble keeping up with current demand. Um, I don't know that we've gotten to a place where we've got back to some of our par inventory levels. Um, but um, as far as, as far as I'm aware, I think, I think most of that is, is back and stable, but um, we could talk offline about it too, because um, we've, we've developed a lot of new vendor relations from this. And um, I actually have a database now of, uh, that I can, I can share with you if, you if you know folks who are in need of uh, different sources. Excellent. Okay. Thank you for that. Judge Mary James, do you have the next question? I need to take you off mute. Take yourself off mute. So thank you very much, Bryce. My question had to do with um, outreach to parents and whether Salem Health is going to do sort of an organized um, outreach to parents because I know a lot of children have um, not been getting pediatric care that they need um, and also children who need mental health care have not been getting that. And I'm just wondering if, if Salem Health is going to do something special to try to really reinforce and reassure parents that, that their children need all of the preventive care that kids typically need um, in this, uh, uh, I, I would say post COVID, but we're not really post COVID in this COVID environment. Yeah, I was saying, I was starting to use the word post COVID a couple of weeks ago and that was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess I don't know if I have a, a real strong specific answer for you. Um, I would have to go in and talk with that team a little more about what specific things they're pulling out. I do know that um, we're continuing to provide all the services we had previously been providing um, virtually, and we've actually shifted a lot of our primary care, and we will not be coming back with the same um, style of primary care as we had done previously. There's going to be a larger emphasis on virtual visits, um, real-time appointments, easier access, um, and I think you'll see even some consolidation of some brick and mortar um, as we as we sort of move forward. So to that end, um, I guess I can speak to it. I, I think your question is probably a little more um, specific than I, than I have much context on right now. Sorry. Okay, good question. Thank you. Uh, Julia Robertson, you are up next in the queue. I had a quick question and it might have been brought up during the presentation and I missed it. Since Salem Health is a large facility, how many people who actually came in with COVID were from Salem and not from small distancing areas where we were the best facility for them to come to? That's a really good question. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have the answer. Uh, okay. Not sure. I would have to go back and, and, and dig that one out. Out of, out of curiosity, was it more people kind of from Salem or was it kind of a mix of everything? Um, from, from my perception, it was mostly from our community. Uh, again, we had set up, Salem Health has a primary care facility in Woodburn as well. Mm -hmm. And um, we had set up a respiratory clinic, which was a clinic specific for testing um, in Woodburn. And so there was certainly some testing being done there. Um, but those who actually arrived at the hospital um, and were, had a hospitalization because of COVID, uh, I, I'm not sure. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Julie, you're next. Hi, Bryce. It's Julie from Family Building Blocks. Oh, hey, Julie. <laughs> Hi. Well, first of all, that was really informative. Loved it. Appreciate our partnership at Family yeah. Building Blocks, guys. My question is, as community members and as Rotary, what can we do to continue to love on you guys and love on your staff? Yeah. Well, that's, that's a great question. You know, at one point, we had been talking about this potential plasma donor. I don't know if you guys had seen this. There was uh, thought process early on if you could collect plasma from someone who had an antibody you could you could help you know anyways so at one point we were getting ready for like this community-wide plasma campaign um, which you know I'm kind of glad maybe we didn't go down that path um, but today um, there's a couple ways to help we've got it online you can actually send a um, uh, a thank you letter to staff we have a portal where you can go in and send something nice to them and in a letter of encouragement we also are still coordinating meals and as silly as it um, maybe feels even at, at this juncture, um, it's a big gesture. You know, today, today La Hacienda showed up and they brought in 122 meals 
Um, and to see some of the departments come down and the joy on their face and the feeling of support, um, it meant a lot, you know, and, and so that's a real practical way you can help. Again, that information's online. Um, and then finally, you know, we're just encouraging people to continue to be wise. You know, um, we all have to do our part as we move through this, and, and that means something a little bit different for each of us. Um, but I would just encourage you to continue to, to look to the guidance and see if there's ways you can be a part of the solution. So, um, you know, the road ahead is, is a bit unknown and uncharted, um, but, you know, our community has, has really stepped up and blessed our hospital, so. Thank you, great question, Julie. Okay, I don't see anyone else's hand uh, in the chat room or in the participants box. And I don't see anyone's physical hand um, flying up in your, on your screen. So, okay. Oh, okay, Farah Etzel, looks like you have a question. And so we'll need to unmute you or, there you I go, Farah. I myself. Go um, ahead. I, um, so Bryce, this is Farah Etzel. I'm one of the pediatric yeah. hospitalists at Salem. Oh, Health. hi, Farah. Oh. So, um, I was going to just answer a couple of the questions. I might have some more information from the clinical Please. side. Yeah. So to judge um, James, Salem Health Medical Group, as, as an outpatient practice, only has one pediatrician. They do have lots of family practice doctors that do see children. Oh. Um, but I do know that the community pediatric groups are really trying to get their doors open, and a lot of them have in-house social work um, counselors and behavioral health psychologists. So they really are trying to encourage kids to come in, whether it's a telehealth visit or come in, and they're all doing the full PPE clinical safety through the practices. And then Julia, you had a question about um, whether or not patients were coming from the immediate Salem area versus surrounding. Salem Hospital is, has the ICU basically. So Polk County doesn't have the ICU capability nor does Silverton or um, Sanium Hospital in Staten. They may have a few ICU beds, but when you're talking about people needing to be on funky ventilator care and all sorts of kind of high level, um, cardiovascular treatment, they're going to come to Salem. Thanks for helping with that. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Well, oh, okay. Linda Bednars, you have the last question and then that will be our wrap for today. Linda Bednars. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up a little bit regarding mental health. Um, I know that myself as a mental health counselor and the people I work with are trying to keeping the businesses open and being open to taking people through um, telemental health. We've had a decrease in intakes for some reason. And I think people just aren't aware that we're there. And so if you have um, staff, um, if you have, you know, kids um, to just let people know to reach out to the mental health um, counseling agencies, mine is new perspectives. There's Valley mental health. There are several people still working and available it is to the telemental health that most of us are doing, but that's just like the doctors nowadays. And, but um, it's there and available. So. Great, okay, thank you for that, Linda. All right, well, that's a wrap for our program today. Let's everyone thank Bryce for his great presentation. Thank you, Bryce. And thank you, Sue Bloom, for being our program chair today. We really appreciate you. Um, it is, was an honor today to welcome our uh, next inductee, our newest member, Laura Foley. So Laura with the Salvation Army, thank you for joining our club today. We are really excited to get to know you better. And I know with your musical skills, I know which committee will be reaching right out to you. Uh, remember everyone, the Rotary International Convention is online, it's virtual, it's coming up starting the 20th. And Renee Campbell, our past district governor, did put the link in the chat room. So you can uh, register online, it, everything is free to participate in those sessions. So please be sure to do that starting June 20th um, is the beginning date. Thank you to our current district governor, Diane Noriega, for joining us today and being part of our club, um, our club meeting today. Thank you so much for presenting that award. Thank you, Barry Nelson, again, you and Ken for all of your hard work. I uh, appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you, Bar Mary Louise Van Atta, for being our guest and joining us. We appreciate seeing your face. Thanks to each and every one of you. Uh, blessings for the rest of this week. And I hope that you are uh, staying well, staying safe, keeping well connected, 
um, to those you love and cherish. So, and including all of us, each other here in this club. So that's what it's all about. Let's stay connected. Have a blessed week. Love you all. See you next Wednesday. We are done. Okay.